when I was four, I decided I will be a theoretical physicist because the books that my dad read to me at night were about rockets and propulsion, and I loved it. I loved it. And yes, I got a bachelor's and a master's in physics, and then I did a PhD in biophysics. And um, I received a fellowship from the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. I came to the U.S., and my um, academic career was as a faculty through Duke and Tulane University. And in 2006, I moved my lab. I was already a full professor to Johns Hopkins University. And um, this university, it has unprecedented commitment to excellence. And I must say, it has supported me every way along the way, provided me with incredible opportunities to grow and to flourish. And I am immensely gratified by the opportunity that I have had to work with so many talented trainees in my own lab, students, postdocs. These people have insatiable thrust, thirst for knowledge. And what's very important is you go to the lab and it makes every day so joyful and energetic. And in addition to that, what is really very important to Johns Hopkins University is this incredible spirit of collaboration we have. I have worked with basic science faculty, engineering, clinical faculty, and this collaboration inspires one to think big science, big, big new science. And I honestly must say, I would not be who I am if it wasn't for these interactions. So that's what Hopkins means for me. Um, now I'm gonna tell you what I do. <laughs> so I um, call the field that I am in computational cardiology. What we do is we build computer models of the heart. And we build them in such a way that we represent functions from the molecular level to the entire organ. And we are very excited about what computational cardiology can deliver. The reason is that computation has transformed traditional areas of engineering, um, physics, you know, cars, airplanes are now built only with computer simulations. We believe that computer simulations can also transform numerous areas of medicine and usher in uh, novel personalized approaches um, to human therapy. We do believe very much into the power of computer simulations. So um, in my lab, what we do is basically we are taking a basic science approach. That's what computer modeling is. And we are trying to bring it into contemporary patient care. It's a very sort of radical and novel approach, but we really are very, very excited about that. And so in one of my uh, projects, we are trying to use computer simulations of the heart to inform the physician about what would be the best personalized therapy for a fast cardiac rhythm called ventricular tachycardia, how to best treat a given, given patient. So um, how would we go about doing something like that? When we construct a model of the heart, we have, it has to be, as I said, personalized. So we start with an MRI or CT scan of the patient, and we, reconst we construct a basically, you can think of the geometrical shell or scaffolding of the, of the, um, uh, of the model of the heart. And then we put in sort of the inner workings of the heart, which is our understanding about the molecular processes, what happens at the cellular level that are described with equations. So in a way, you have a scaffolding with a lot of other information that we put in. And this scaffold is personalized because it comes from these scan, scans. And we can also incorporate disease properties in it. So in this first project, we're using this personalized model to tell the physician how to best treat this very fast heart rhythm called ventricular tachycardia. Now, normally in the clinic now, the um, um, dysarrhythmia is treated by using a catheter and burning a piece of the heart, which is actually um, sustaining the arrhythmia. So one has to find this place. And this is the most difficult process of this treatment. To do that, a physician would navigate the catheter in the heart, and then the procedure takes between four and 12 hours in which the heart is interrogated point by point by this catheter to record, record all the electrical activity and construct a map. And this procedure has very 
is very inaccurate and has fairly very low uh, level of success, about 52% um, success rate, which is very low. And the most importantly, it is very invasive. And so what we want to do is, instead of having the physician do this interrogation with the catheter, we construct this model of the heart and we non-invasively predict where are the arrhythmias, what we, would be the most optimal place to navigate the catheter to, and then we want to provide this information to the physician, and then the procedure is very swift and done. And so we are very excited. We have done retrospective studies, and we have demonstrated in every patient which has been ablated in the clinic, our prediction was much smaller lesion that also terminated the arrhythmia. So that's one project. Another project we are um, involved in um, is predicting which patients um, have a very high risk of arrhythmia, therefore they should receive an implantable defibrillator to prevent uh, from arrhythmia uh, claiming their life. And we do computer simulations of the patient before decision is made where the defibrillator should be implanted to predict the risk. And then so we are able to say, okay, um, this patient should have a defibrillator and this not. Currently, in the clinic, this is done by one number. It's called ejection fraction. This is the percent of blood ejected out of the, blood, of the heart. And if it is below 35%, defibrillator is implanted. This criterion is so insensitive, it misses a lot of people who actually constitute the largest number of people who die of sudden cardiac death, most of them in the prime of their life. So we are hoping to develop a much, much better criterion that is based on this non-invasive um, simulation of risk prediction. In another project, we do also predict where to ablate for arrhythmias in the upper chambers in the heart. Atrial fibrillation is the most common arrhythmia in the world. One out of three people will have that. And as the population ages, this becomes very prevalent. And a lot of patients develop what is called fibrosis. And these um, these fibrotic hearts are extremely difficult to treat for arrhythmia. They do not know where. It's a very difficult procedure. Uh, they do not know where to burn. It's unclear um, what the, exactly what are the pathways, the arrhythmia. So we are predicting, using these patient-specific models of these top chambers, to predict where to deliver the therapy. And the last project I want to talk to you about a little bit is concerns defibrillation. You know that's delivery of a strong shock to terminate um, arrhythmias. So in a normal um, patient, when you have an implanted defibrillator, uh, the can goes here in the pectoral cavity, and then you have a catheter that's in the heart. But in children and patients with congenital heart disease, you cannot place that. You cannot put the defibrillator within the heart. So it has to be placed somewhere else. And there is abs absolutely no rule where it should be. And improper placing of the defibrillator will result in a lot of inappropriate shocks, or worse, not deliver the shock when it's needed. So we have extended our modeling strategy when we are doing from the molecule to the organ to in incorporate from the mo molecule to the organ to the whole torso. And we can construct these models of heart torso that incorporate the unique geometry of the congenital heart disease. And then we have, um, we can predict what would be the best location to place the device so it can deliver the most appropriate therapy. And if that actually works, that will spare a lot of children and patients with congenital heart disease um, operations to reposition the device. So we believe, we are very excited about um, these non-invasive approaches that we're developing because we do believe that they will result, it's a paradigm shift, right? And they will result in a, um, um, you know, patient well-being, less morbidity, mortality, also a lot of savings in terms of healthcare costs.